everyone, welcome to Unfolding the Universe First Light. I'm Ashley Zielinski, um, and tonight we have Elaine Stewart and Paul Geithner who are going to be speaking about the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, but before we begin, I'll give you a little introduction to the exhibition. Um, so I've been working with the NASA Webb team for seven years now, uh, starting in 2016 when I saw the Webb Telescope while it was still on Earth in a clean room. I made the gold sculpture exploration, which you can see in one of these rooms after. Um, and yeah, since then, I uh, worked with a, a couple of scientists, kept in touch, and uh, I was approached by Maggie Massetti, the curator of this exhibition in 2020, uh, during the pandemic. They were looking for some, somebody to uh, help them do public outreach to uh, prepare for launch and get the public excited about launch and get the get the good word about web, web telescope out into the world. Um, so we discussed using VR um, and I had never done VR before. So I made my first VR piece uh, unfolding the, the universe, uh, a NASA web VR experience. And I interviewed a bunch of scientists and engineers on the web team. You can see their portraiture around the, the virtual reality space. And when you walk up to it, it's sound mapped. So you can hear a little bit of that, that interview that I did with them. Uh, we released the VR world on Christmas 2021, along with the launch of Web. Uh, we had a, uh, a launch viewing party where some of the scientists and engineers uh, came and talked to the audience, and we, had, we opened it up to the public to come by and hang out with us while we watched Web go to outer space. Uh, so yeah, and since then, I've been keeping in touch with these guys. We've been making cool art, um, doing events in the VR spaces, uh, and then July 12th, when the first images were released at NASA Goddard, um, I, I got to be there with the whole crew and say hi. I saw Paul that day. <laughs> um, and I got to hang out with the entire web team while they were releasing these amazing, gorgeous first images. And then I hit the ground running, came back to New York um, with the photos on thumb drive, and made all of the other pieces of artwork you're seeing in this exhibition in under three months. So uh, I can't thank my amazing team enough for helping me make uh, all of these sculptures and screen prints and holograms and installations a reality. Uh, under three months to make all that is just a, a crazy time. So thanks everyone. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to introduce Paul Geithner, who was one of the um, engineers that was in the uh, VR space. And he's gonna tell you all about the James Webb Space Telescope and his involvement, so Paul. Cool. astronomical observatory it's in space it's built to answer some fundamental questions that really no other observatory can adequately answer um, it's big for a spacecraft it's three and a half stories tall and it covers about the area of a tennis court and it's optimized to see infrared light now infrared light is light of wavelengths just a little bit longer than visible wavelengths light which is what we see with our eyes um, you'll feel infrared light as radiant heat so that's what infrared light is. A little bit longer wavelengths than red, the color red. Um, and this has been the National Academy of Science's top astrophysics priority for NASA for over 20 years. Um, it's an international endeavor. Um, it was led by NASA, but it includes the European and Canadian space agencies. Um, this was first really talked about seriously in 1989. That was a year before Hubble was even launched. Because even then, scientists knew that Hubble probably couldn't answer some questions, even as powerful as it would be. And, um, and we really got started for real on it in 1996. So it was a quarter of a century 
to make it a reality. Um, over that time, the United States spent about $9 billion on it, spread over those 25 years. Um, the international partners, um, that's not included, that $9 billion doesn't include their contributions, so there were several um, billion worth of euro and, and uh, Canadian dollars in there too. And why is this? so who's James Webb? James Webb was NASA's second administrator. So he was really the leader of NASA when the Apollo program got going. He was appointed by President Kennedy and he was not an engineer or scientist. He was a manager, but he, he, uh, he thought NASA should do more than just send um, humans to the moon and bring them home in a race against the Soviet Union in, in a battlefront in the Cold War. He thought that he really believed in public-private collaborations and endeavors, and he wanted NASA to, um, to be a force for science. And um, so Webb is a lot of his legacy, and that's why this observatory is named after him. So I'm gonna, this is what I'll talk about tonight. Um, I'll talk about why, you know, the case for Webb. I'll spend some time talking about the design, building, and testing of it. Um, I'm an engineer, not a scientist, um, but I did stay in Holiday Inn Express last night, so I know a little bit about the science. But um, seriously, it was uh, a quarter century was all of this, putting this, designing and putting it together. So um, I talk a little bit about that, and then um, finish up with, you know, the whole reason we built it was to be a tool of science and, and using it. So why web? So, this is the slide that when I'm done usually makes small children cry, so we'll see if this works. Okay, <laughs> telescopes are really powerful tools of exploration. So what do I mean by that? Well, the universe is overwhelmingly vast compared to our human notions of space and time. So what I'm gonna describe to you next is a one billionth, one ten billionth scale model of the universe. And hopefully at the end of it, you'll, you'll understand why telescopes are, are good things. So. At this scale, and the things I'm gonna talk about are relative to where we are now here in New York City. So at this scale, the sun is a grapefruit. Um, in real life, the sun is almost a million miles in diameter. It's big, although it's a yellow dwarf. It's not, it's kind of a small star, but it's big, big compared to us and compared to the Earth. But at this scale, it's a grapefruit. Earth is an ice cream sprinkle, and it's 15 meters from the uh, sun, so it's almost back to the glass doors there. Oh, and the moon's a poppy seed from a bagel, and it's orbiting the ice cream sprinkle about a little over an inch away. Also at this scale, the speed of light, which is the speed limit of the universe, it's kind of the speed of causality. It's roughly the crawling speed of an ant. So it's gonna take the ant eight minutes to crawl from the grapefruit to the ice cream sprinkle. Um, it'll take the ant about a, one and a quarter seconds to go, one and a third seconds to go from the ice cream sprinkle to the poppy seed. This is as fast as anything goes in the universe. It's slow. Um, the next nearest star, remember there's, we live in a galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, it has hundreds of billions of stars in it. That's a lot. Um, the next nearest one, which is Proxima Centauri, it's a walnut in Las Vegas. It's gonna take the ant four years to crawl there. And then Sirius, which is um, a familiar bright star in the northern hemisphere, it's one of the closer stars. It's almost nine uh, light years away. And it's basically in Lagos, it's volleyball in Lagos, Nigeria. So, um, oh, and the observable universe is bigger than it is in, in um, light years old, if that makes sense, because space itself has been expanding. Um, and the uh, universe is big, but it's actually bigger than we can see. And we're seeing new parts of the universe all the time as it, the light from that region finally reaches us. And finally, the farthest man-made object ever is Voyager 1. It was launched just over 45 years ago. It's only 2.3 kilometers away, for crying out loud. It takes light almost a day to go when, it, when they send radio signals back, and it's still talking to us, it takes almost a day for those radio signals to get here. 
If it were headed towards Proxima Centauri, it would take it about 86,000 years to get there. And that's like one of the fastest things that we've ever uh, sent out into space, and it's the farthest away thing. So that I've made, I think I've made my case that telescopes can go far, far beyond where we can go ourselves or send our robots. And so they're really powerful tools of exploration. Um, so what a telescope does is it's, it's optics, and it gathers and focuses light for instruments. And it's those instruments that are cameras and spectrometers, so they take images or they record spectra. And a spectra is just like passing light through a prism. Um, it spreads it out into its constituent colors, its constituent wavelengths, and you can see what wavelengths are actually make up that, that signal. And um, imagery tells a structure, and it's beautiful, and it makes it an above the fold in the New York Times. But spectroscopy is something you don't see much, but there's a lot of science content in there because with spectroscopy, we can tell what things are made of. We can sniff the atmospheres of planets orbiting nearby stars with spectroscopy. We can say, there's water, there's carbon dioxide, there's methane, there's whatever there. Um, this is pretty cool. Okay, so why, why is this thing an infrared telescope? One, eight, one question that's been around a long time is how did the lights turn on in the universe? And um, the very first luminous objects that formed in the universe emitted light at visible and ultraviolet wavelengths. But it happened so long ago, and all of space has been expanding since the Big Bang, that those wavelengths of light have been stretched out, like you saw in that little um, animation with the with the uh, silly putty, such that they reach us today as infrared light. So if you want to see visible light from the beginning of uh, the first objects to form in the universe, you actually need an infrared telescope today to see it. And this is an old question, Hubble can't answer it because it's not big enough and it doesn't have the wavelength coverage and it doesn't have the sensitivity. If you want, what, what's called for is a very large, very sensitive infrared telescope. And remember, I said infrared light is basically heat radiation, so um, if you want an infrared telescope to be really sensitive, you actually put, have to put it in the space so it's not looking through the warm atmosphere, which is a huge background source. And it needs to be super cold, and you're not going to get it super cold without turning into a, a bad, frosty freezer from the 1950s, right? So big, big telescope, put it in space, get it cold somehow. Um, that was what Webb was first in, envisioned to do 30 plus years ago. But a new field of science has come along, which is under uh, studying planets around other stars and maybe looking for the, to see if they're habitable, see if there are signatures of, uh, that say maybe life could exist there. And exoplanets just happen to be a, an infrared telescope's a great thing to use for exoplanets because exoplanets are cool, so they're brightest in the infrared, the black body radiation peaks in the infrared. And they're often formed inside dusty clouds, the, the, the detritus, the leftover from previous generations of stars that have died and spread their heavy elements that they've made through nuclear fusion into the uh, into space. And because we're made of star stuff, anything heavier than helium basically was made by stars since uh, after the Big Bang. So we're all made of star stuff. And um, uh, exoplanets, they're cool. And um, like I said, spectroscopy tells you what elements are made of, because every element molecule, if you pass light through it or if you heat it up and, and it emits light, it, it has very specific wavelengths it will absorb or emit. And that's why spectroscopy can tell us what things are made of. Exoplanet science wasn't even a thing when Webb was conceived, and now it's a hugely interesting field of science. And an infrared telescope just happens to be perfect for doing this work. So now a little bit about building this thing. Um, so I mentioned large, that the single biggest thing that makes a telescope powerful is really the size of its main optic, because the bigger the telescope's main optic is, the more light it can gather, the more sensitive it is, the more resolution it has, the more powerful it is. Power goes roughly with the fourth, um, the fourth power of diameter of a, of a main optic of a telescope. So, web needs to be big for resolution and sensitivity. It needs to be cold, as I mentioned. And when I mean cold, I mean it's pretty cold. 60 Kelvin, it needs to be less than that. So that it's not, it's limited by the natural environment that it flies in in the solar system. Because there's, there's this very diffuse infrared background in the inner solar system. And um, 
we're actually so sensitive that we're limited by that background. And to be that, to, to be that sensitive, it has to be colder than 60 Kelvin. So Kelvin is the temperature scale, it's in, where zero is absolute zero, and the grades are the same as the Celsius scale. So minus six, um, 60 Kelvin is like minus 370 Fahrenheit, something like that. Uh, nitrogen is a solid at this temperature, so it's pretty crazy cold. Okay. Um, we put the optics and the instruments that need to get cold behind a big five-layer umbrella and um, fly it in a place in space such that we and orient things so that the telescope's always in the shade. And by being in the shade, it can actually get really, really cold. Just like the desert can be blazing hot in the daytime, but it gets really cold at night because the sky's clear, there's not a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere to trap uh, infrared light. Um, so the heat just can just escape, and by morning it's pretty cold. Same idea here. The, uh, um, we can get down to uh, single digit Kelvins if you wait long enough by passive cooling, just being in the shade of a, of a umbrella. Um, it's so big that it won't fit in a rocket in its operational configuration. Um, and it would be too delicate in that configuration. So we had to design this thing so it could be folded up very compactly and structurally sound and then unfold it in space. So um, we call it the origami observatory for that reason. And then its location we sent it to a place where the gravity of the Earth and the Sun kind of create a balance point um, for this to hang out, and so it's orbiting a, about a million miles away in the midnight sky. And I'll talk more about that later. And that way we can always keep the Sun and the Earth on one side of that umbrella and let the optics and the instruments see the other side. And if you just wait six months, you will have seen the whole sky as Webb, and in companionship with the Earth, follows you know, orbits around the Sun. And this is what it looks like. Doesn't really look like a telescope you might be used to. But it's pretty cool. All right, so this thing was a really challenging engineering problem, mainly because the size and the cold combined. So I mentioned its operational configuration is too big, too delicate to launch, so we had to decide to fold up and then unfold in space. It, that involves 53 different types of deployments. The actual deployment count's bigger, but there's 53 types. We used 178 release devices to pin this thing together for launch that they had to all be released in, in a particular sequence so this thing could unfold over a two week period. And there were 295 single point failures, one, any one of which, if it didn't work, could have ended the mission. So this made us all pretty nervous. <laughs> But you know what? It all worked, and it was a lot of hard work. It didn't happen by accident. Thanks. Um, the telescopes and the instruments had to be built perfectly wrong at room temperature so that they're exactly correct with these cryogenic operating temperatures. What I mean is, you know, most things expand when they get warm and contract when they get cold. Um, different materials change shape and dimensions at different rates at different temperatures. We had to compose web of different materials, and we basically had to construct it um, so that it would, when it did get cold, it was all deployed and got cold, it would be all the right shape. So the mirrors are actually all the wrong shape at room temperature, but they're perfectly the right shape at, at um, operating temperature. Um, and testing this thing was really difficult because of, of this. So, you know, we had to test all these deployments multiple times, all these try to make sure we didn't have any of those 295 single point failures bite us, right? So um, this required a lot of really fancy marionette equipment, basically, and other offloading equipment to um, deploy this thing, which was designed to work in the weightlessness of space, but you're doing it on the ground. Um, we had to do a lot of performance testing in vacuum chambers, so we'd have these giant pressure vessels. You put hardware in there, you close the door, you suck all the air out of it, and then you run liquid nitrogen and really, really cold helium gas through, through pipes that line the inner walls of the chamber so that uh, they act as a heat sink and you get the hardware to really cold temperatures in the vacuum and then you test it, you see if it works under those conditions. Um, but we couldn't do the whole observatory all at once, everything all at once, um, because the temperature range with, you know, 200, almost 300 degrees Fahrenheit on the sunny side and minus 380 Fahrenheit on the cold side. Couldn't, 
it's just not feasible to do on the ground. And luckily we didn't have to do that. So we kind of tested it in two halves. And we did test the telescope and instruments as a package end to end. We put light end to end through it, made sure we could line up those optics and make it work. Um, and we proved it would work. And then through multiple tests stitched together with some uh, complicated analysis, we were able to show that this thing thermally would work and structurally would work. And, um, and speaking of structural, uh, we, not only did we do performance testing, but we shaped and baked this thing. So we shook it on um, big vibration tables. We screamed at it with um, sounds much louder than uh, Led being in the front row of a Led Zeppelin concert. Um, and this was all to uh, make sure it could survive the rigors of launch and also make sure we put it together right. It was a workmanship check. And um, so we put this thing through its paces. And a lot of technologies had to be either advanced way beyond the state of the art or even invented to make this whole thing feasible. So enough with word charts. This is kind of cool. So we put the telescope and instruments together after testing them um, environmentally at NASA Goddard in Maryland. And then we sent the telescope in its own little clean room, which is about the size of a tractor trailer. Uh, and sent it to Texas. And there's this vacuum chamber left over from the Apollo era that we modified and installed a bunch of fancy test equipment in and tested this uh, telescope for 100 days. And guess what happened right in the middle of the 100 days? We had Hurricane Harvey hit. And thankfully, we'd spent years um, planning for just such an event. We said, you know, we got to be ready for a once in 500 year hurricane. So we got to make sure all our systems are good and, uh, you know, enlarge the tank farm for liquid nitrogen and all that stuff and thank goodness because we, we powered right through it it's a 100 day test 24 hours round the clock for 100 days and we pulled it off and it went great so then we shipped the telescope in that uh, container on a big c5 aircraft and then sent it to um california where um folks from north of grumman had been building the spacecraft and the sun shield and so we put those two things together and then this is what the sun shield looks like deployed and it's five layers of um, really thin capton which is a kind of plastic it's like really fancy trash bag material <laughs> um, with aluminum vapor deposited on it and um, the two layers toward closest to the sun are two thousandths of an inch thick the other three are only one thousandths of an inch thick and they had to be we had to design these to take just the right shape and under tension when, when deployed so that they blocked light from the sun, but they didn't redirect light into the telescope. Uh, really fancy device uh, over a, let's see. Yeah, it was like a mile's worth of cable, 90 cables just to, to do the, um, to deploy the sun shield alone. Um, uh, 600 pulleys and mechanisms, it was crazy. So uh, now it's built, so let's take it to space. So we put it on a ship and um, folded it up like it's gonna be for launch, put it on a ship and sailed it from Seal Beach in Southern California through the Panama Canal to, the, to French Guiana, which is where the European spaceport is it's kind of europe's version of um cape canaveral and uh, the europeans as i mentioned are partners with us and one of the things they did besides two out of the four instruments that are on the telescope they provided the launch vehicle and the launch services and so we flew on an Ariane 5 which is a, a really nice rocket that uh is very highly reliable and uh so we're doing this it's funny that that launch site, I'd like to say it's, it's like the movie Papillon, but with rockets. It's, 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 that's actually where the launch site is. It's, it's at the old penal colony and just offshore you see Devil's Island. So we got on top of the rocket and then the rocket's leaving the building where, where uh, that final assembly was done. And here's launch. Christmas Day last year. Forest to the edge of time itself, James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. 
And then 26 minutes later, after powered, fl powered flight was over, we separated from the launch vehicle. You see the Horn of Africa and the Reagan Peninsula here. Uh, so 26 minutes were, were over, we're quarter way around the world, and we separated. And we're watching this in real time, which is pretty cool. And we see the sun solar array come out, which we didn't expect. We thought this might take a while to do. But because the Europeans gave us such a nice launch, it was, it was perfectly done, basically. And the satellite came off the rocket perfectly straight. That the, uh, this, this deployment, which was the only one that was automated, everything else was commanded from the ground. We, um, this work this came out as early as it possibly could and we were thrilled to see it. And then we knew we were making electricity out of the sunshine. It was really important to get that solar array out because the battery we were on since 11 minutes before launch had like seven hours of, of life on it if we didn't get the solar array out. So getting that solar array out and getting power positive was huge. And then this is, this is um, two weeks shoved into a minute and a half. Those 53 major deployments I mentioned, you're, you're gonna see them all here. Again, 178 release devices, 295 single point failures. They all had to work. So we spent much of the last several years on the program rigorously testing this thing and making sure that when that we folded it up for the last time, we did it right and um, we knew exactly what we had done. Because every time we tested this thing and had to fold it back up, it was like a reassembly procedure. So you could, it's like an edge sketch We kind of erased all the work we did with the previous test. So we had to make sure that last dough was perfect. And here you see most of the deployment activity is associated with the sun shield. So um, these telescoping booms came out and dragged with these cables that are like only steel cables, only a millimeter thick, pulling them out. And uh, so one thing to make this super challenging was these membranes are really thin, they're floppy. If you don't control them and all the cables used to pull them out and tension them, they can get snagged very easily in, in the weightlessness of space because they'll just go where they want. So the design incorporated all these um, tiny little party favor devices, really ingenious and, and simple that could we, we never had a piece of membrane or a cable uh, that was unconstrained over longer than about an 18 inch length. And that way we always knew where things would be and they wouldn't uh, get entangled and we wouldn't have a snag because that would end the mission. And then the telescope unfolded and that's, those are, that's rigid. So it was kind of like straightforward. Um, that wasn't easy, but it was it looked easy compared to Sunshield. Um, and then, it took us about a month to get to our, our destination in space, which is called Lagrange Point Two. So, Louis Lagrange, famous mathematician, he, he said, hey, any three body problem, um, if one of the bodies, that's a cape, there's no single solution, it's a chaotic thing. So, but if one of those bodies is gravitationally insignificant, guess what, there's five places where the gravity of the two big bodies kind of create these happy places where it's easy to put something. And, um, they're called Lagrange points. And so a lot of satellites that study the sun or go to L1 because they can just look at the sun all the time and point their antenna at Earth and tell you what's going on. L2 is a great place for web because you can always keep the sun, moon, and Earth on one side and see basically half the sky the rest of the time. And like I said, as if you just wait six months, you'll have seen the whole sky. Um, and uh, and the L4 and L5 are actually kind of like garbage collection points. The other three are metastable. It's like trying to balance a BB on a saddle, but L4 and L5, there's actually little, there's rocks that are kind of stuck there, asteroids. And, um, but yeah, so, and Webb's not the only thing at L2. There are some other, um, it's the equivalent of the mountaintop for ground-based astronomers. Um, there are a few other uh, spacecraft out there and we had to get away from the Earth because the Earth's a big room temperature object. If we were in low Earth orbit like Hubble is, we would never get cold. And you'd be going from daylight to nighttime every 45 minutes, and um, that just wouldn't work. Um, so L L2, you're about a million miles away, and um, it's a benign thermal place, and you can get really cold. 
And that just shows how we can see almost half the sky at any given time. Just wait a few months, you see everything. So this animation really helps visualize it. So we L2 is this virtual point. We're actually orbiting it. It would be, it's easier to orbit L2 than actually sit at L2. And besides, if we sat at L2, we'd be eclipsed from the sun by the Earth. And the one thing this is inaccurate about is the Earth happens to subtend half a degree of arc from a million miles away. So it looks to be the same size as the sun, and it would perfectly block out the sun, just like the moon just happens to be at the right distance from the Earth right now that it perfectly blocks out the sun and causes an eclipse, but that's our orbit. Um, and then here's a little bit about alignment. So this thing, uh, it, it wasn't aligned when we launched it. We had to, we had to um, uh, all these, the mirror, to be able to fold it up, we couldn't make it one big mirror, so we made it in pieces. And, but then the trick became, well, we gotta line those pieces up to within a fraction of a wavelength of light when it's in space um, by remote control. So the, all those 18 primary mirror segments and the secondary mirror, which is the second thing that lights hit, light comes in, hits primary, comes back to the secondary mirror and then goes back towards the instruments. Um, those are movable. And the, uh, we had to line all the 18 segments together as one optic. So the first image we got was 18 random images of the same star. And then we moved each mirror in order to go, oh, which one is, goes with which image? And then once we figured that out, we arrayed them um, into a pattern like the primary mirror has. And then we stacked them all on top of each other. And, but now, yeah, you've got all the mirrors lined up, but they're not surfing the same wave, so to speak. You know, one mirror can be here and the other surface can be here, and you want the, all their surfaces to match so that the, the whole mirror is coherently phased. And so there was a lot of software and a lot of work involved to develop this process that, you know, now is no big deal. But it was a huge challenge a long time ago, and um, future telescopes that are going to get launched from the ground and are, you know, segmented mirrors like this, they'll, they'll take advantage of this um, technology. And this is what an alignment image looks like. So, um, if you're an optics person, this is like, oh wow, that's awesome. So, um, <laughs> uh, the reason it has spikes is because of the hexagonal honeycomb nature of the main mirror. You, uh, light is a wave. And you know, if you pass uh, a wave through a hole, it doesn't just go like a, a straight, you know, thing. It, it, it diffracts. Um, and waves that their peaks uh, fall on top of each other, they, they, uh, they constructively interfere and or a trough and a peak of another of two waves coincide, they destructively interfere, right? And you get a flat wave. It's like, uh, anyway, sorry, I'm rambling. But the but light's a wave. So it, it'll diffract, it'll interfere with itself. And because we have this beautiful mirror made of all these, looks like a big honeycomb, we get diffraction spikes. You'll see the same thing in camera shots that people have because the aperture of the camera, even though it's maybe a single lens, the aperture stop has, has a shape to it. And so you'll get these spikes. Hubble has four spikes because it, the, the cross piece that holds its secondary mirror is in front of the main mirror. And even though it's one big, solid mirror on Hubble. But um, with Webb, you get the six spikes. And then the reason you see this is because of that tripod that holds the secondary mirror that's in the way. So it shows up on really bright stuff, but it's, it's, uh, and it's easy to track down, and it's pretty much an artifact of any optical system. But one more thing I want to say about this image is, you know, we're trying to find stars that were all by themselves to do these alignments. And everywhere we look, we're still seeing we're seeing galaxies that maybe nobody's ever seen before. Um, there's no dark spot in the sky anymore with Webb. You can't, you can't point it anywhere and see something dark. And then this is how the fields of view of all the instruments look on the sky. So if you imagine the whole screen looks like the, this crowded star field, which is a picture of the small Magellanic cloud that's on, or no, it's a large Magellanic cloud. It's a dwarf galaxy that orbits our own galaxy. And it's just chock full of stars. These are like windows, like this whole screen would look like this.
but each instrument is like a window into a part of the sky. And these are all the fields of view of the instruments. And then this is the best part, <laughs> using Webb. So Webb is operated from Baltimore. Um, the observations are actually competitively solicited in annual cycles, and we're executing a cycle one now. So the people that whose observations are getting executed, they proposed them like a couple of years ago, and then they were selected in a double-blind process uh, to try to take institutional bias out of it and things like that, because scientists looking at other scientists' stuff, right? And, uh, so it's an interesting process to make sure that there's little bias in it. It's all about the, the science potential of an observation. And um, they're all planned, and then basically, uh, roughly every week, we code them, the observations, they get scheduled together, and then they're uploaded, and the, the uh, software on the observatory is smart enough to basically execute them quasi-autonomously. And um, then the raw science comes down, and it's all processed on the ground. We get it, it comes down um, by radio to Earth. Web's about five light seconds away, so it takes five seconds for that signal to get here. And um, it comes down on KA band, which is almost the same uh, frequency as direct TV. So it's like ESPN, but for science. <laughs> and, and then the data and findings become either public right away or shortly thereafter. And then the engineering-wise, we, you know, we're always in, almost always in touch with the telescope, and we get we get and telemetry down. We have sensors all over this thing that tell us what temperature it is and how's it doing, and and um, that's how we know how the spacecraft is doing, and that's engineering data, and that comes down on a lower frequency, um, again, to the Deep Space Network, which is a network of satellites, space kind of, there's three of these around the world, so at any given time, one of them's always in view, because, you know, Webb's kind of hanging out there in the midnight sky, but, you know, it's midnight for anybody, and the Earth's rotating, and Webb's kind of out there, so to make sure we always have an antenna on it, we've got these things spaced around the world. And then, whoops, this is just a picture of uh, our mission operations uh, control center. This is, this, was, uh, this is the mom, the mission operations manager, Carl Starr. He was our mom for the commission, excuse me, the six month commissioning of this machine. And then, now I get to show you some pictures. I'm almost done. So, you may have seen some of these, but on July 12th, scientists were we all have been thinking for years. What can we, what can we select for observations that will be beautiful and showcase the scientific capabilities of this machine um, when we reveal it? And so this is the Southern Ring Nebula, which is really beautiful. Um, it inspired some artwork by Ashley. Uh, that piece is here, and this is this is that nebula in near infrared light. This is in mid infrared light, and at these longer wavelengths. The, the light can actually penetrate the dust that's enshrouding stars in here. And it reveals the star that's actually the source of all this stuff being blown off, and it's that red star. And then I mentioned spectroscopy. So this is kind of what a spectrograph looks like. Um, wavelengths, you know, it's, um, it's uh, you know, light intensity versus wavelength. And this is of a planet that's kind of like Jupiter, but it's orbiting its parent star very, very closely, so it's really hot. So this is basically saying this, this uh, Jupiter-like planet orbiting really close to its star, star is really hot and its atmosphere is full of steam. And then this is something called Stefan's Quintent, and it's, it's a, a group of galaxies about a quarter billion light years away, a little farther than that, and they're gravitationally in this dance. and. Um, when cal galaxies interact like this and collide, they create a whole bunch of starbursts, and uh, there's a lot of science in this image. And then this is pretty cool. This is a deep field image. Uh, uh, Webb in 12 and a half hours stared at the darkest part, part of the sky you could see, and this is a pretty small part of the sky. It's like holding a grain of sand at arm's length. And there's thousands of galaxies in here, and some of them are distorted because there are actually multiple images of the same background galaxy that got distorted by a galaxy that's closer to us that acts like a 
gravitational lens because Einstein figure, he figured with his general relativity figured out, hey, you know, mass warps space and it can bend and light travels in a straight line, right? But this, it's traveling through warp space, so it's like bending light. And we can use these foreground clusters of galaxies as nature's magnifying glass to see things that are very far away and behind and magnify them. So it's kind of a cool shot. And then lastly, this one seemed to capture the public imagination more than any other. This is the Carina Nebula, which is um, a cloud of dust material left over from the deaths of previous generations of stars. And new stars are kind of blowing it away. And new stars and planetary systems are being born in the knots of this cloud. And it's just, just it's scientifically, it's like really cool, but just from a uh, appreciation of its beauty standpoint, it's really, it's really pretty. And then here are some more recent observations. The Tarantula Nebula, um, which is a really interesting region just outside our galaxy. And this is just really beautiful. There's so much science in here. I don't, I gotta leave Elaine time to talk, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, this is the same galaxy in three different views. This is visible from Hubble. This is, um, this is from Webb at longer wavelengths, and it's showing the, basically the dust skeleton of this galaxy. And then when you overlay them, you get this in the middle. There's the one on the right is cool. And here's Jupiter in infrared light. And it looks different because, you know, the, the material that makes up Jupiter presents itself differently in the infrared than in the visible uh, spectrum. But it is pretty. I mean, you can even see Jupiter's ring, which is incredibly tenuous, not like Saturn's, which is really obvious. And then here's Neptune. So Neptune with, um, uh, from Voyager when it flew by many years ago. Neptune from Hubble and Neptune in the infrared. And Neptune's very bright in the infrared because it's the atmosphere, the nature of its particles, it, it just reflects infrared light really well. And you see the rings, which are beautiful. Um, all the outer planets have, uh, the four outer planets, two gas giants, two ice giants, have rings. But Saturn, of course, is famous for it because you can see them. Um, but these other ones are hard to see without modern equipment, but it's just a beautiful image. So and we can actually take images of planets around nearby stars. So the, the white star is actually where the parent star is, but we have things on the instruments called coronagraphs where you basically put a spot in front of that star so you can block out its light and cut down on the glare and see what pops out. And there's, it's kind of a crappy image, but hey, it's an image of an exoplanet. That's pretty amazing. And Lastly, back when Hubble uh, took this picture here, it's called the Pillars of Creation. This is the Eagle Nebula, which is a pretty neat object that, as an amateur astronomer, you can take a picture of. Um, probably won't look this good, but this is <laughs> this is in, in, uh, visible. But in infrared, this is a lot of dust, and there are stars and planetary systems forming inside, but you can't see it because the dust grains are on the order of the size of the wavelength of visible light, and so it's, it's opaque to visible light. But at longer wavelengths, you can penetrate these dust clouds and see what's inside. And you certainly see that the resolution is amazing compared to Hubble, but you see more, and the two are very complementary. And there's just so much science here that scientists can mine for a long, long time. Yeah. So, you know, I'll just end with one last video, and I, I do want to say that, you know, we Webb was conceived and built to do certain things, you know, from seeing the very first luminous objects to form in the universe, to galaxy evolution, to you know, sniffing the atmospheres of exoplanets, and maybe even looking for the conditions that uh, make, we understand that make life possible. But I really think that its great discoveries are going to be answers to questions that we haven't even yet thought to ask. And so with that, I'll leave you with this. We have uncovered wonders unknown by our ancestors who first speculated the nature of those wandering lights. I hope you can hear it. We've crossed the solar system and sent ships to 
the stars. Oh shoot. <laughs> I ruined it. Hang on. <laughs> who first speculated on the nature of those wandering lights in the night sky. We've crossed the solar system and sent ships to the stars. But we continue to search. We can't help it. A sensual element of the human future lies far beyond the earth. or you know get a lane up here and uh, we'll both answer questions later but um, thank you very much really appreciate it all right so our next speaker is Elaine Stewart um, we've been friends for a while now she was also one of the scientists that's featured in the VR space so definitely check that out after her talk um, so I'm going to pass it off to her, and then we'll do some Q&A with both Elaine and Paul after. So hold your questions until then. I'd like to introduce Elaine Stewart. Thank you so much, Ashley. So I will be speaking actually a bit about my specialty for the Webb Telescope, which is contamination engineering. Some people may have heard the term before, some people might not be familiar, but the whole goal behind being a contamination engineer is actually keeping the sensitive surfaces, especially our beautiful optics, as clean as possible so we get the best images possible. And I wanted to just point out, I'll be speaking a bit about how we accomplish this throughout the entire duration of the mission, but um, I was thrilled to be able to go to the launch campaign that we had in French Guiana. So this is a picture of me with the Ariane 5 rocket. Just a little bit of comparison for me compared to how large the rocket is. Okay, so with our four main science goals, you know, we're looking at some of the first light that was created after the Big Bang, how are galaxies formed, what is the star life cycle like, the, the birth and the death of stars, and additionally, planetary systems and origins of life. So you can see along the bottom, um, with each various telescope, we have different regions that they are specifically designed to. And for Webb, we're looking in that infrared wavelength so that we can look back at some of these really distant and really faint targets of observation. Now, what's really great is that we can use in combination these um, observatories together. So we were just looking at some images from Paul where we were comparing and even overlaying sometimes images from Hubble and Webb together. And to see some of these first objects, we, might, we must have the optics be very large. Now, if we're looking just with our human eye, it's relatively small and we can only collect just a small fraction of starlight. But for these very, very distant objects, um, we need to make sure that we have a primary mirror that is wide enough, large enough, so that we will actually be able to gather all of these light particles, which are photons. So we have these telescopes that are much wider than our eyes, so we can collect more starlights and then make those really dim objects appear brighter. And after we looked at you know, what are our main targets of observation, we came up with a the mirror had to actually be six and a half meters, which 
This is difficult from a contamination engineering perspective because we actually have an open architecture. So the optics are unprotected throughout the integration and testing phases of the web mission. Additionally, um, you know, we had to actually fold the telescopes that we could fit into the Ariane 5 rocket. So here's a quote that was from 2010 Alan Dressler, who's an astronomer. NASA had a strong desire to build the first of the new telescopes rather than the last of the old. So I wanted to highlight here all the creative engineering that went into the Webb telescope will be implemented in our future projects too. And you know, in each various engineering discipline, we had to come up with new methods to actually implement and be successful with the Webb telescope. So again, to see that very faint signal, we had to be very, very clean. So we had a new set of challenges for contamination control, or CC. So for the first of the new telescopes to be clean, we would have to have new contamination control approaches. So these exposed instruments and optical surfaces need to be kept clean over the years that did turn into decades, which encompass building, testing, transporting, and then actually launching the observatory. We actually had to do all this work in many different facilities um, in the U.S. and around the world. So here is a depiction showing that you know, we started at Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. We then performed our environmental testing, which also included having a protection which involved a tent to kind of create a barrier between leaving the clean room and trying to keep the observatory in the best conditions possible during testing, to our STARS transporter, which you can see in this third image on the top, that is actually like a mini transportable clean room, which then took us to Johnson and the testing in the cryogenic vacuum chamber, make sure that we would actually be able to operate everything while we were in space. Then over to Northrop Grumman in Los Angeles, California, for the integration with the sun shield to become that full observatory. And then back into our STARS transporter when we went to French Guiana and the launch site for those final steps before launching to L2. Now at each phase we had um, contamination requirements in both particulate and molecular that we were tracking. So this was actually created as a collaboration with the science team where we balanced the contamination levels versus stray light and sensitivity. So for a particular contamination, particles can create scatter, and this will actually impact the observations. So if you think about it, if you have a, um, you know, like even think about a dirty window, if you look through that, you can't see as much if there's dirt on it, particles on it, and it's kind of the same way with our optics. So if we have particulate on it, then we will be able to see less, and it will actually take us longer when we are trying to make our observations. So we want to, make sure that we don't need to have longer observation times and cut down the science. We want to have the cleanest optics possible. So we actually determined our end of life requirements would be 1.5% um, area coverage. So that's just a metric that we're able to analyze and track throughout the process so that we know, you know how much of the surface is covered with particles and what size particles are actually there for our primary mirror. And then for the secondary mirror, which is much smaller, we had 0.5% um, area coverage as a requirement. Now, this um, secondary mirror requirement is a bit more stringent because as I mentioned, the mirror is smaller and that is the um, second, second optic that is reflected into the instrument. So we want to make sure that it is as clean as possible for the best science to be accomplished by the instruments. And this data down at the bottom is actually the um, analysis that was performed in conjunction with the scientists, looking at the stray light so that we could figure out the cleanliness level that we needed to achieve, and also the transmission budget. So if you have different levels of particulate or molecular contamination, how will that actually affect what you're able to see? Um, now to keep in line with our particulate contamination requirements, we actually cleaned the mirrors. So right after we went into the cryovacuum chamber testing at Johnson Space Center, we um, had developed and tested on a surrogate at Goddard the best way to clean the mirrors. And we actually took around two weeks to perform this very stringent, very careful process 
of cleaning every single mirror on the primary mirrors and the secondary mirror too. Now, we actually did perform this a second time prior to going to the launch campaign, but this is one of our ways to reset the optics throughout the integration and testing. So let me talk a little bit about molecular. Um, molecular contamination is anything that can be like a thin film or a grease, and it's non-volatile residue, or NVR. Um, we can have carbon, which can polymerize post-launch, and then even water. So water can be released once you get to space, and this water will quickly freeze. We were just talking about how cold the telescope has to operate, and that can actually ice up your optics or even some of your deployable mechanisms. So we need to be very careful about um, our molecular contaminants. So we determined that for the primary mirror, it would be 392 angstroms. This is accounting for various measurements in the NVR, carbon, and water ice. And then for the secondary mirror, it was 330 angstroms. So throughout the integration and testing process, including our chamber testing, we found that our biggest threat con to contamination and meeting these requirements was actually monitoring and preventing against water and ice. Um, so we actually implemented specific uh, SLI, which is single layer insulation. We use it a lot for thermal controls and we can actually orient it in ways to help protect our optics and our sensitive surfaces. I'll talk about that a bit more later. We also worked closely with the thermal team to examine the cool down profiles and the warm-up constraints. So this was during our cryo vacuum chamber testing, but we implemented all of the lessons that we learned on it for on orbit. So to protect our sensitive surfaces, we want to make sure that um, anything that we care about is going to be warmer, so the contamination will gravitate towards cooler surfaces. So this involved lots of complex modeling and analysis to make sure that we understood the cooldown profile on orbit, and we would actually be able to ensure that we weren't going to trap contaminants on any of our sensitive surfaces. So let me talk a little bit about a project that I have the pleasure of working very closely on, and this was actually how we obtained some molecular transport data and mitigated against water and ice for the Webb telescope. So here we have the primary mirror, and then this is the secondary mirror. This is the inboard hinge. So as you can see, while the secondary mirror is stowed, which it was for about 10 days after the launch, the inboard hinge is very, very close to the secondary mirror. Um, now, during these 10 days, the telescope is cooling down to operational temperature. And in that time period, you know, we're concerned about water being released and ice accumulating. And in this inboard hinge, we actually have, you know, what we would consider outgasser. So outgassing is basically the um, release of, from a material in a, uh, like if you think about like a new car smell. So it's kind of like that. We monitor every single material that we use on the telescope. We test everything to make sure that we don't have any high outgassers that could actually result in molecular accumulation. But here in the inboard hinge, we have what we consider some high outgassers. So there are some cables, some motors. We have a radiator that has a coating on it. So we needed to find a solution for how could we mitigate against possible ice accumulation on the secondary mirror in this configuration. This is actually a view of what it looks like without any of the um, thermal enclosure, any of that SLI that I talked about. So what we did is we actually performed inspections and we performed some modeling to figure out how we could improve the geometry of the um, thermal enclosures and actually provide directional venting away from our sensitive surfaces. So we took off all of the blanketing that was originally there since we had found some gaps and we made sure that we had preferential venting away from our optical surfaces. And here you can see, you know, just a reflection in the secondary mirror just how close this inboard hinge was. 
I just also wanted to mention that this was really important to us because we didn't have a heater on the secondary mirror. So if ice did accumulate, then we would not have a way to actually be able to warm that up and get the ice off. So we solved um, this portion of the problem by actually making sure that there was um, specific adhesive contact of all of the thermal SLI. We made sure that there was no line of sight for any of the high outgassers, so any of the cables or the, um, the radiator, we tried to vent away from the optical surfaces. And at the same time, we actually performed um, some testing. So we used the cool down profile. Now this was a model that was given to us by the thermal team in conjunction with the scientists so that we could understand exactly when um, the heater was going to be turned on for the inboard hinge. Now, don't have a heater on the secondary mirror, but we do have a heater on the inboard hinge, which is really where that um, release of water can happen. So at the time the inboard hinge was turned on, the secondary mirror was cold enough to condense water. Um, so we needed to make sure that we again made those modifications to the thermal enclosure, and then we performed testing to make sure that we understood what kind of outgassing rates we would expect to see from the inboard hinge hardware. And the result of this was actually that the web on orbit commissioning team performed a bake out of the inboard hinge prior to the secondary mirror deployment, but while the optics were still too warm to actually condense any of the water. So this made sure that we would not have any ice accumulation on the secondary mirror that we'd have to worry about for the rest of the operations of web. Now I've spoken a bit about the mirror cleaning, which was you know, direct contact with our flight hardware and also the inboard hinge modifications protecting the secondary mirror, also direct contact with the flight hardware. But another important aspect of contamination engineering is making sure that any facility the flight hardware goes into, any ground support equipment that comes into contact with the flight hardware is also at the same requirements. So I'll tell you a little bit about the Ariane 5 fairing. Now this is a depiction, well it's a picture actually of the Ariane 5, but the fairing is the very top portion here. That's where the web telescope sits in. So again, we inspected, monitored, cleaned, not only the observatory, but anything that came into contact with the telescope. So here's a graphic just showing you where Karoo French Guiana is. Our launch campaign took place last fall of 2021, and we actually had to move between a couple of different facilities for our final integration, the fueling, and then going on top of our launch vehicle. This is just a little bit of information about what we had to do in each facility, not only at the launch campaign, but every facility that the Webb telescope was in throughout the duration of the mission. So usually as contamination engineers, we go in, we try to understand the airflow in each clean room. We um, work to do inspections, so we're usually using white light and ultraviolet light so that we can understand if there are any particle generating areas, things that we need to clean up. And this is something that we did in, um, this is the bath encapsulation hall at the launch site. So this picture shows you just how large this room is because we have um, the Arian 5 fairing, this was our fairing for the mission, the Arian 6 fairing, which is for the next rockets to come. We were one of the last Arian 5 missions. Our web telescope over here, and then actually another um, measure that we implemented with contamination in mind, which include our HEPA filters. So HEPA means high efficiency particle air filters. And we actually had these just so that we could control the microenvironment around the Webb telescope. And we performed what's called computational fluid dynamic models to understand how the particles would flow around the telescope making sure that we weren't going to, you know, cause more problems by our airflow than help. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to be pushing particles onto any of those sensitive surfaces. And an important part in understanding whether we need to implement HEPA filters or not is taking particle counts. So this is a picture of me in another facility at the launch site measuring our particle counts. Um, 
Now, when we're talking about particle counts, they're actually quite small. So we were operating in class 10,000 clean room, which is mostly based on 0.5 micron size particles. Really, really small. Um, so this particle counter is going to tell me in a cubic foot of air how many different particles I have in various bin sizes. So the 0.5 range, one, part, one micron particle range, and I'm also able to get this data from some samples that we have placed around the facility too. So all of this work happened in the facility to make sure that we were ready to receive the telescope and receive the fairing. When we actually received the fairing, um, we performed a final cleaning. There were initial cleanings that were actually performed at Beyond Gravity in Switzerland, where the fairing was from. Um, so this final cleaning actually involved Beyond Gravity representatives, ESA, NASA, and Kines from the launch campaign. Here you can see the Ariane 5 fairing, and this is scaffolding next to it. So the Ariane 5 was actually placed on top of the scaffolding so that we could walk up inside of it and perform white light and UV inspections to make sure that it was as clean as possible. Now we wanted to do this because this was the last environment that Webb was exposed to before launching. We had been so careful throughout the entire campaign to make sure that it was as clean as possible. We wanted to have the fairing be just as spectacular as all of the other environments it's been exposed to. Um, one of the contributors that we were most concerned about is the fairing acoustic panels. Now, in this view, you can actually see that there are quite a lot of them. So <laughs> these panels were actually tested at Goddard Space Flight Center and at um, the ESA Aztec facility in the Netherlands so that we could understand what kind of particulate fallout to expect from these panels. They did make modifications for Webb so that we would have the best possible environment. And here's a picture of me actually inside of the fairing inspecting. Um, you can't tell from the angle of the picture, but I think it was somewhere way up here at that point inside of the fairing. And um, after we cleaned the fairing, we wanted to make sure that those final days, you know, right before encapsulation and during encapsulation, what was seeing the best environment possible. So the Kness team actually built what we have called the air shower curtain, which is depicted here. And this area that you're seeing is right here. So it's kind of a nightmare that this door opens to the outside. The tropics in French Guiana involve many, many challenges, but we were able to contain the environment, kind of create a microclimate where we could work for the last couple of days while Webb was on the launcher, and then have a safe encapsulation of the Ariane 5 fairing on top of Webb. So through all the different mitigation efforts that I've talked about, looking at the particulate accumulation, molecular accumulation for both the flight hardware, our facilities, and any kind of um, launch vehicle or ground support equipment that come into contact with it. We were very successful in our efforts. Um, this quote mentions that they found no critical issues or no measurable contamination that is actually blocking our optical path for web. So we're able to successfully gather the light from distant galaxies and deliver it to the instruments without issues. I just wanted to show you some numbers that we're really proud of. I mentioned the end of life requirements for the primary and the secondary mirror. So first we'll look at the particulate. The primary was 1.5 and we measured 0.754. For the secondary mirror, our end of life requirement was 0.5 and we had measured 0.149. And for the molecular, you can see we measured 45 angstroms where that end of life requirement was around 300, which means that we came in way under our requirements and that just helps the scientists to make these observations in shorter amount of time so that we can do more science with the mission. Okay, and with that, I'm just so thrilled to have been here and thank you so much for having me.